So it's with great honor and pleasure that I'm going to introduce uh, Professor Sharon Vaughn, who's going to give this year a very fortunate, she's going to give um, the memorial lecture. There's so many things to say about her. Um, I'm just going to say a few. Uh, Professor Vaughn is truly a leader in the field of learning disabilities in research and in practice. She was the editor-in-chief of the journal of learning disabilities and the co-editor of the learning disabilities research and practice. She's a recipient recipient of multiple awards from the AERA, from the University of Texas. She's uh, written many, many books, over 250 peer-reviewed research articles. But more than anything, we're just excited to hear about your work. Thank you so much for that introduction, I appreciate it. And thank you so much for inviting me. It's really an honor to be here. This is my very first trip to Israel, and I'm really proud to have it be as a invitee to the University of Haifa and to this very important symposium. Um, um, we have heard uh, so much today about uh, teaching, reading, and languages uh, in addition to English, but other languages as well. And then, of course, we had the really fine presentation earlier about uh, how we should consider uh, progress monitoring and maybe new ways to do that. And so I'm going to uh, shift the conversation a little bit, and I hope it is a conversation. I'm really inviting you to ask questions and make comments and contribute to how we can sort co-construct better uh, interventions for students who are not responding to traditional um, approaches that work for most kids, but are not working for them. So the way I am organizing the talk today is I'm going to talk to you about a particular study, a very large uh, randomized control trial that was funded by the National Institute of Health. And I'm going to use that study as an illustration of a set of studies over the last few years that are helping inform the way in which we think about reading instruction in, um, for comprehension, understanding text, particularly complex texts. And as Roland Good reminded us earlier, we're much better at the foundation skills, that is getting kids to read words and know how to read them then we are getting kids to know how to construct the linking of those words in ways that make sense. And as that text gets more complex, our challenges have increased. So that's the organizational format. Join me as we sort of think through this process. So I want to recognize and honor uh, Dina Fadelsan, in whose uh, name this particular lecture um, is dedicated, and I am going to start with one study. Um, uh, one more preface, if you'll uh, allow me. There are two people here, two doctoral students who are here, who know a lot about this kind of work. So, Gary Roberts, raise your hand if you don't mind, and Phil Cabin, raise your hand. So, if you have some really hard questions, go right to them at the end of this presentation <laughs> and see what they do with them. Um, uh, and also, th I want to thank them for their contributions. So um, the, the purpose of the study I'm going to tell you about is really to look at the efficacy, whether or not we can design effective reading interventions with students in the upper elementary grades. So that target group of kids in like fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, and this is really going to focus on that age group. And the hypotheses underlying the work that I'm going to talk to you about are that students who receive these multi-component, we think, thoughtfully designed treatments um, uh, that really focus on things like vocabulary and fluency and, and really sort of as a way of building background knowledge within text to enhance comprehension, are going to outperform um, students who are in a comparison condition. So just to kind of give you an overall view of the study, um, it starts in fourth grade. It's a multi-year study, but I'm going to focus primarily on the first year, which is in fourth grade. 
These are all students who have a lot of problems with reading comprehension. So they're um, below one standard error measurement on a state level test. But this state level test is kind of a low bar test, meaning that if you don't do well on it, it's really a problem. Um, they've been nominated by teachers as having reading difficulties, but here's the real signal that they have significant problems. A standard score on a norm-referenced test, like gates McGinnity, which is a pretty good assessment of reading comprehension, they're 85 or below, so they're one full standard deviation below. So these kids have pretty significant reading problems. And then they're randomized um, to uh, one of two conditions, a treatment condition or a control condition. If you look at those bottom boxes, you'll see that they are doubled up on the treatment, and that's because we two to one randomize. And what we mean by that is that we over randomize to the treatment condition because we, we have reasons to believe the treatment condition is efficacious, and that's sort of an ethical way to do it, and we can sort of handle that statistically. So. That's the organization. And then um, they are further randomized in the treatment condition to one year of treatment or two years of treatment. And to give you a sense of the participant pool, they're high on free and reduced lunch, which in the United States means that they have, um, we would consider them uh, low income students for the most part. And if they were in special education, and the target for their instruction was reading, we included them. So we didn't leave kids out because they were identified as dyslexic or learning disabled. And that we also have a disproportionate number of students who are what we would call Latino or, or who have um, English and Spanish as part of their um, language. But all of the students I'm going to talk to you about were taught to read in English, okay? And in terms of our measures, you're going to see these when I talk about the outcomes, but just to give you a mental set for them, we relied heavily on the Woodcock-Johnson, including the letter word identification, passage comprehension, and spelling. We also administered the Tower, which is a word reading measure, the TOSREC, which is really a measure of fluency and comprehension, and then the gates McGinnity, which is again a more distal measure of comprehension. You know, you read passages and then you answer questions, and the passages are both in um, uh, narrative and information text. Okay, so what did the intervention look like? Um, let me give you sort of, again, a view of the way in which we have been thinking about comprehension, because I think you'll see that, I hope you see that represented in the treatment. If you look at the ways in which most people have been thinking about comprehension over the last three or four decades, you will see a history of work that looks a lot like what we might call strategy-based reading instruction. So we think about strategies for getting students to understand main idea. Or we think about strategies for getting students to understand cause and effect. Or we think about strategies for getting students to be more meta-aware or have meta-comprehension, right? That has been a heavily influenced focus in reading comprehension. I am thinking we need to shift away from that. And so I'm going to give you a short explanation for why. And if you want a longer one, maybe sometime over the next day or two, we can have a conversation. But I think we need to shift away from that because the cognitive load that that kind of strategy instruction takes occupies a lot of the mental resources that students have while they approach that difficult tack tap task of reading text, remembering it, because these are the very same students who have working memory problems, right? And so we take the kids that have the working memory problems and who need reduced cognitive load because they also are the ones that even though their word reading is better than it was in second grade, they're not our best word readers. And these are also the kids for whom oral reading fluency, that is reading with automaticity, comes with challenge, right? So these kids are loaded up cognitively already when they're approaching this task of reading text. 
we take that very group and what do we do? Later on, more cognitive demanding tasks by asking them to remember and learn all of these strategies. So, what we are trying to do is reduce that load that comes with more um, typical strategy instruction, some of which I have personally been responsible for in the research literature, I might add, and, at, and focusing more on building knowledge and vocabulary as a mechanism for targeting comprehension. Okay? So does that make sense to everybody? So when you look at the components of the instruction that we're talking about, there's heavy influence on vocabulary, text-based reading, so that a lot of focus on the practice of reading the words, and then sufficient word study to improve the automaticity, okay? So in this particular treatment I'm going to tell you about, there were 80 sessions for the students. A session really takes place in about a 35-minute time period, five days a week, and it um, takes place with approximately four to five students in a group, and then all of the tutors that provided the intervention, we hired and trained. So they were part of the study. And to give you a visual image of what that looks like, the academic vocabulary was organized in these two-week units in which we had new words, and the new words really served as a Velcro for connecting related words, because we're never going to be able to teach them the meaning of every word they need. And then reading fluency occurred about three days every two weeks with a special emphasis on what I would call build-up fluency. So what I mean by that is you learn to read words really fluently and sentences really fluently and then paragraphs. And then there's a combination of what we would call at, on level text, but also the students with the most significant reading problems need to learn what I would call stretch text. That is text that's sort of outside their boundaries of what they typically read. That's not all they should be reading. But as long as they have support, they need this stretch text because otherwise what happens is when they're asked to read text that is at their grade level, they literally give up. They haven't had any experience with it. And then we do a lot of focus on this um, sort of does it make sense idea. And just briefly speaking, where this idea comes from is really the literature on metacognition and meta awareness which is that like as readers, all of you do this just naturally. So as long as you're awake, which some of you might not, might, might not be right now. But if I gave you some text and you were awake um, and I asked you to read it, if you come to words or ideas that don't make sense, you automatically do things. You reread, you repair the not making sense. You go back and text. My observation has been that students who have the most difficulty do not do that automatically. They are unusually comfortable with things not making sense, right? In fact, they're uncomfortably for us comfortable with things not making sense. It makes us nutty that they can say any crazy word when they're reading and it doesn't bother them at all. They have low irritation with things that don't make sense. So what we wanted to do is sort of teach them how to get irritated when things don't make sense. And so we have sentences where words don't make sense and then we ask them to, first of all, does the sentence make sense, yes or no? And if it doesn't, what doesn't make sense? Okay, so everybody's with me? All right. And then the last thing is we always work on word study. And in particular, what we've been working on a lot lately is high-frequency words, even with older kids. Because these high-frequency words really contribute to syntactically incorrect uh, sentences that really throw them off. So we've been doing a lot of work in that area. So this is sort of the global view of what we're up to. And when it comes to vocabulary, which is what I sort of led with, we're really working on getting students to not just be able to know the word for the sentence or the paragraph they're reading, but really to have sort of a mastery of it. And actually, I learned a lot of what I'm about to show you with this vocabulary from um, Malt Joshi's colleague, Deb Simmons. 
in which we use pictures or very brief videos and then the students interact with the text. And there's plenty more examples of all of our lessons. We have them posted on our website, which I'll show you at the end of this presentation. And so when it comes to text-based reading, I told you that we use a lot of stretch text and we do a lot of work in information um, text. And why do we use information text? Because we're really working heavily on building background knowledge. Because really, honestly, after fourth grade, what predicts reading comprehension? Vocabulary and background knowledge are huge predictors. And once you get over the hump of word reading, those are the big goodness. Okay, so what do I mean by stretch text, just so you get a feel for it? It's text in which students are reading something about information, like this is, would be a typical kind of thing that they would have in the U.S., where it would go, explorers had been landing in America uh, before English settlers arrived in what is now Jamestown, and they have to read all this stuff. They do this in every country, I'm sure. And then you get asked questions. So the interesting thing about this is that we really want to not focus on getting the students to think about strategies, but to really do these two things. This, is really, this really comes from some of the research on situation models, where the question is, what is this about? What's going on here? And if students can't really just answer that brief question, what, what's going on? What's happening? And then, how does this relate to what you previously read? Just those two big questions. If they can't get past that, there aren't enough strategies on earth to get them to understand what they read. And then, of course, we're always looking for word checks, word meaning checks. So I was telling you earlier about the does it make sense stuff. So here's sort of an example about does it make sense. And how many of you in here ever work with uh, individuals that have serious reading problems, whether they're dyslexic or not? Okay, so watch this. So when Columbus sailed west from Spain, maps of the world included hotels for explorers. Does that make sense? Well, I hope you would say no. And then I would say to you, so what doesn't make sense about that? And I hope you would say, what word doesn't make sense? Hotels. Yeah, we would hope there weren't any hotels then. Okay, so another one would go something like this. The number four, the speed that the speed that players throw, kick, and bite the ball makes soccer an exciting game. Okay, what does it make sense? <laughs> well, okay, how many of you could imagine some of the individuals you work with not thinking anything was wrong? Yeah, so really working hard and getting students to sort of, if you will, come to life when they read. I mean, it's actually like lights go on when they realize this is supposed to make sense. You're not supposed to just get through it. It actually is supposed to make sense. So and then we do word study, and I was telling you about that. And we do, we do actually word lists in which we have a series of word lists, and the students get to own the list by mastering the words, by being able to read them in a timed fashion and 15 words or less as a way to really get through these high-frequency words. And there are high-frequency words in every language, so you could certainly do the same thing no matter what language you were teaching in. And then, of course, because I've known Roland Good for a long time, and he's here, and he would be really upset if I didn't have this slide, we also do progress monitoring. And of course, we do progress monitoring to inform instruction, and we use um, growth models every week, and we use that as a mechanism for deciding whether or not we need to adjust instruction. And then, of course, because we're doing a research study, but even if we weren't, we're interested in treatment fidelity. And what I mean by treatment fidelity is the extent to which the individuals providing the treatment actually do what it is they are supposed to do. And do you want to know how we measure that? We use digital recorders in which we record every single session and then we randomly select sessions and uh, listen to them and then determine and rate the fidelity based on a scale. And so if you look at the scale, if you look at their overall quality, meaning how well they did, the overall quality was 3.71, which is pretty good on a five-point scale, but not great. Wouldn't we rather see it at 4.8? 
And then if you look at the implementation based on each of the components, the actual implementation is pretty high because that was a four-point scale. Okay, so now here's the interesting thing. All of us, or most of us, work in this educational lab called schools, right? <laughs> and in this educational lab called schools, we don't have anywhere near the control we would like. And this study is a classic example. We have what we think is an exciting study, an RCT, randomized control trial, well organized. And guess what the schools decide to do with our control group? <laughs> Unfortunately, they teach them. It's so disappointing how they do these things. But so what happens is we have a two to one um, ratio. So we're doing treatment, we're controlling it, we're the researchers, we're providing the treatment I described to you to two-thirds of the students. And they decide to provide another intervention with their teachers to the other third. I mean, after all, we've identified them as at risk. So they do this responsible thing of all times, mostly they usually don't, but in this case they do something very responsible and they start uh, teaching these kids. And they provide pretty robust uh, instruction and we just did the analyses on this and the students in the control group actually ended up with more time in supplemental intervention than the treatment kids. So what we really have in our design now is rather than a treatment group in a comparison condition that we would hope is a control condition, we have two treatment conditions, right? So we're about to see what happens when you get two treatment conditions. So what do you think happens when you get two treatment conditions? You don't get a lot of differential growth but we actually got lots of acceleration, and you'll see that in just a minute. So um, basically, I'm about to show you some of the uh, findings from this, which also include the effect sizes. And just so you know how to interpret the effect sizes, they are all reported in, uh, as standardized effect sizes. Okay, so I will also give you, for those of you that hate uh, slides like this, I will also show you bar graphs and line graphs. But basically, this is the p-values and the effect sizes. And you can see that when it comes to statistical differences between the treatment condition that the researchers provided and that the schools provided, there's very little differential effect. However, all of the groups grew, even though they were very low to begin with. So if you look at the top line, I would call it gray. What does it look like here? It looks gray, but so is that gray? Yeah, OK. That, that was actually my way of saying if anybody in the audience was awake, thank you, the two people that answered. All right, so the um, typical instruction is at the top, and those are students who, I call them typicals, because these are not students who are identified with reading disabilities, okay? And you wonder, why am I showing you their progress? Why do we pre and post them? Because we want to look at whether or not we have, for our very lowest kids, similar or dissimilar kinds of slopes. So if you look at the control condition, which is blue, and the uh, treatment condition, which is red, and these colors will remain the same on all of the slides, what you see is that for word reading, the control started off, even though they were randomized, slightly higher. And those effect sizes, I don't know if you can read them, but they're about 90, a little bit below 90 for the treatment condition. And you can look at that by post-test, we have standard score gains of three and four points, which is quite high, because with standard scores, what would you expect? Not raw scores on standard scores, what do you expect? Pretty much a flat line, right? Because you have to outperform the expected growth in order to get acceleration. So I want you to remember that, that there are standard scores and not raw scores. So now look at spelling. I love spelling because uh, when you work on word-related uh, activities, you always get really giant growth in spelling. So you can look at our grade line for the typicals. The typicals, there's not much growth, a little growth with respect to standard scores. But really, you look nice growth from both our control, I mean, they're not really controls, they're really uh, school-based treatment versus our treatment on spelling, which is really nice. And then if you look at um, fluency, and these are both um, the fluency-based, uh, which is comprehension-based fluency, and regular word reading fluency, again, very nice growth in, in both conditions. And this is showing nice acceleration beyond what would, would be expected if the uh, treatment were not provided. 
in comprehension, boy, comprehension is always just such a tough one to crack, and we're going to talk about why in a little bit. But we did get some nice acceleration um, with um, comprehension, but again, we did not get differential acceleration based on our treatment condition. Although the acceleration rates for the treatment conditions are greater than those from the control condition. And so what I'm doing now, just so people don't get confused, is I'm just showing you some bar graphs that show the same thing. So the redundancy here is um, that these are the measures we looked at earlier. And you can see the control is sort of light blue. The treatment is dark blue. And you can see that our two treated conditions vary very little. So. As I mentioned to you, we took half of the students in the treatment condition and we randomized them to a second year. And we did that initially. We didn't do the randomization after the first year. They were randomized at the first year to a second year of intervention. And we provided a similar intervention. And this time we really focused it on science. So we used the content area of science to really build some of the information. And the rest of the treatment looks pretty much the same as what I described to you earlier. Uh, unfortunately, we are still analyzing um, the results of that work. Um, but again, we had the same condition with our control or comparison group at the school level also being treated. So, just as background on the intervention changes that we're putting in place, is that we're taking advantage of some of the promising research that really suggests that integrating strategies that support cognitive processing through academic instru uh, instruction may accelerate our academic progress. So what do I mean by that? How many of you remember, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, when we had a very heavy focus on cognitive processing independent of academic work? Like, we would do things yeah. like visual memory processing. We would just focus on that in isolation. Or we would do auditory processing. We would focus on that in isolation. Do you remember that? Yeah. I'm not talking about that. So don't think I have, I'm going back in time. What I'm really talking about is using those, same, those cognitive processes and integrating them into the academic work as a mechanism for bootstrapping what we know about memory and attention and regulation to put them in the service of acquiring better reading comprehension, okay? So, there's a lot of pitfalls to what we did in the past. We assumed, for example, that students that had learning problems had cognitive processing problems. And we assumed that if we isolated those cognitive processing problems, we could pinpoint them and remediate them. That's not what we're doing. We're really trying to figure out how to take the, the priority cognitive processing um, as targets for integrating into academic. And so the two we're really focusing on, and you'll see them at the end, so the rest of these components should look the same as the ones I showed you earlier. And then on the end, you're going to see that there's a heavy focus on self-regulation, monitoring, comprehension monitoring, self-monitoring, and attention as a mechanism for improving reading. And so, and actually, uh, Garrett Roberts has done a lot of that work, and he's here, so he's a good person to talk to. So, so in terms of how we do that, you can see, I, what I was trying to do with this slide is give you an idea of how much time during each session is spent on each of these things. So that's about it. And then we integrated this self-regulation around goal setting. And so we really want students to sort of be thinking, you know, here's my goal. Am I working on it? Can I do it? And then at the end of the lesson, they sort of reflect on it. Did I achieve that? So um, we're in the process of more fully exploring the relative effects of these kinds of cognitive processing mechanisms as we integrate them. And we're really trying to uh, better understand how malleable 
these cognitive processes might be with respect to improving them as outcomes, but also improving the outcomes related to comprehension. So we have a battery of tasks that focus on things like executive functioning and cognitive processing so that we can examine it more carefully. And you will see that that's labeled further analyses because we're in the process of uh, examining these outcomes now. And so I'm just sort of listing all of the outcomes. Um, my colleagues at uh, the University of Houston, uh, Jack Fletcher and uh, Paul Cyrano, are very interested also in some of the um, brain imaging work that we're doing to see whether or not we have changes. And I think someone cited, someone had a slide from Jack Fletcher earlier. We're doing, yes, thank you. Thank you, Malt. We're doing very similar work to that. So, um, in terms of, well, I, I don't think I'm going to talk about the predictors of change right now. I think what, really what I want to do is get to the conclusion so that I can tell you some things that I think are really important. First of all, regardless of the researcher, our school provided treatment, because there weren't differential effects, it would be easy to interpret that data as not being very significant, which of course I have some days in which that's the case for me. But here's the thing about this data that really is interesting to me, is that despite the fact that the differential effects in the treatment groups were not a, a evident except on measures like spelling, we did close the gap. We did make a lot more progress on reading comprehension. And very few studies with students after grade three have done that. And the gains are really substantial when they're compared to standard score gains from all previous studies that have focused on this age group. So um, they do support the hypothesis that it might be necessary to provide even more intensive interventions, for example, longer or smaller groups, and to make it even more focused. And that's why we extend, are extending the intervention for two years. So, um, I think I have a few more minutes, don't I? Who's my who's the time boss? Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you for saying that because I have uh, three more things that I think are important. I want to talk a little more about this idea of more intensive interventions because we've had such not just we meaning our research team, but all of the research teams have really struggled getting really powerful impacts on reading comprehension when you use standardized scores. So what can we do about that? So when we think about making an intervention even more intense, we mostly think about individualizing it or customizing it based on the student's needs. So we look at academic profiles, right, diagnostic profiles, Right, Susie? Where's Susie? We look at diagnostic profiles and we try to map those diagnostic profiles onto a set of instructional practices we think will be customized to improve outcomes for students. We work on that. We try to make um, our focus be on more frequent and precise progress monitoring. And we try to make the amount of intervention they get even more extensive. And so if we look at how successful we've been with these intensive interventions, um, my uh, colleague, uh, Jean Wanzek, and I looked at all of the intensive interventions that were provided in kindergarten to third grade, not just our studies, but all of them. And you can look at that the mean effects range from two, three to six, seven, okay? That's K through third grade. But if you look at um, grades four to six for intensive interventions, the mean effect sizes are 0.10 for comprehension and 0.16 for fluency, much lower. So we really have to wonder about what it's going to take to really move the needle on reading comprehension. So I'm very briefly, in four minutes, going to show you the findings from a study we did that was a three-year intervention. We started in sixth grade. We had students with very significant reading 
problems, more than three grade levels below. We randomized them to a treatment and control condition, and we had a true control condition this time. And students were, that were in the intervention for three years, sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade, watch this. On the Gates-McGinnity reading comprehension, distal measure, very impressive effect sizes, right? 1.20. In fact, if I would tell my graduate students, if you see an effect size like this, don't trust that researcher <laughs> because the effect size is too high, but it's real, I promise. So, and then of course on word reading, we got an effect size of 4.9. These are very nice effects. But watch this. When is an effect size of 1.20 on reading comprehension test inadequate? The answer is, it's inadequate when what it reflects is a decline in the performance of the comparison condition. And the reason this is important is because it isn't true just in my study. It's an issue that we need to be aware of, which is that after fifth grade, after about age 12, students with significant reading problems decline in their reading comprehension if they are not provided very robust reading supports. We have this idea that the beginning grades are important, which they are, but the importance doesn't stop there. So, we're, we're beginning to think that if you really want to make the kind of impact you need on students with very intensive reading interventions, you need to have a really strong classroom-based intervention and a really strong, intensive, what we would call a more one-on-one, uh, one-on-two, one one one-on-three intensive intervention. So we've done a series of studies trying to build core reading in the content area. And our effect sizes are pretty good and they are all statistically significant. All the green ones are statistically significant so that we're getting effects on knowledge and comprehension. And I tell you that because what we really think, or what I think, is that if we're going to get the kinds of effects we need, we need to think about what we're doing across all the content areas. So I hate to go to, to be such a proponent of reading, but we have to have reading instruction in the content area in social studies, science, language arts, math, everything. Yep. Plus, we have to have intervention yep. if we're going to make the kinds of robust uh, impacts we need to. And so if you want to look at any of these studies, or if you would like to look at sample lessons that re represent the kind of thinking we're doing with our instruction, all of that is available at this website, and you can download it free. Thank you very much. Sometimes they have hard time in understanding what is monitoring mm -hmm. while comprehending. Mm -hmm. and I have I find difficulties in their own understanding and comprehending texts. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the problems we have is this bridge between the theory and the children. So the question really is that um, we need a way to assure that classroom teachers really understand 
what we mean by putting comprehension practices into place. Um, is that right? Am I getting the right idea of this? That they really don't have a complete understanding of how to do that. Is that right? The teacher training is problematic because it needs to be part of the teacher training because they really don't know what we mean. And, and I, you know, absolutely yes. Yes, so we need to do more with teacher training. And I also think that um, uh, my thinking on this is that we have to figure out what the three or four priorities are and to teach them very, very well so that they become automatic for our teachers. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking that it may be hard if we teach teachers to do 10 things, they will do no things. But if we teach them to do four things, they might do two things. So I, I'm thinking if we can kind of think about the three or four most important things we want them to do with reading comprehension across the content area, instead of, I mean, I will say for myself, 10 years ago, I used to try to teach them everything I knew. I thought teachers needed to know everything I know because if they knew everything I knew, they would be teaching like me and they would be wonderful and then the whole world would be so much better. And, and, and I really think I was misguided. I think I need to I need to stop teaching them what I know and start teaching them what they need to know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh